Before the break, we asked which household appliance was originally horse-drawn. And the answer is A, vacuum. I might be wrong here, but I feel like having a horse in your house is probably going to cause more need for vacuuming. But anyway, <laughs> I digress. Uh, welcome back to Jeremy Vine. Extra coming up, should we be proud of Gary Lineker? We'll be speaking to the refugee who lived with him and he thinks we should be. But now I'm pleased to say I am joined by Dr. Helen Evans-Howells, who is here for Talking Health. Now, this section of the show is devoted to answering your questions, your medical related questions. And today we're going to be talking about allergies in kids. So you might have noticed a reaction from your children or your child um, that they might have had with some milk perhaps um, and you might be worried about giving them certain types of food for fear of a reaction happening do give us a call and hopefully Dr Helen will be able to answer any questions you might have nothing is too big or too small just call up 0207 862 22 is the number okay Dr Helen let's start with a very basic question what are we talking about when we say a food allergy it's not just not liking something or not really disliking the taste no, it's a bit more than that, although sometimes the way it can present with younger children is that actually they, they seem to not be liking the taste because actually they've got an aversion to the food. So what a food allergy actually is, is basically an abnormal response from the immune system. So it's reacting to something that shouldn't cause us any harm, like milk or grass pollen or cats or dogs. And then it sets up a specific signs and symptoms that occur often in a really classical pattern. So they're usually immediate, so it's very obvious often that they're occurring although there are different types of allergies that can present. And we have some foods here that are, are, are very, very common in terms of causing allergic reactions in children. So we've yep. got uh, prawns and eggs, uh, peanuts. What, so we've got uh, wheat, presumably, yep, or wheat. gluten. Yeah, wheat and gluten. Uh, milk. What, what are we looking at here with the nuts? There seems to be lots of so, nuts there. Yeah, certainly if you've got nut allergies, you want to be very clear about what you're actually eating. So 90% of all allergies are caused, like you say, by milk, eggs, soya, wheat, um, seafood, fish, nuts. So we've got peanuts, which is actually a legume, and then tree nuts, so they're slightly different. And a lot of people are often confused by the name nuts. So they think that coconuts are nut or pine nuts are nut, but actually they are different. They're not what we class as tree nuts. So you can be allergic to one thing. You could just be allergic to coconut. Um, or just peanut or just cashew nut. So we really need to specify for the individual. Well, because I remember as well when uh, I came out of hospital, my, my son had very dry hands. They were telling me to put coconut oil on them. And mm. then somebody else said, don't put coconut yeah. oil in them because then they put their hands on their mouth and it's all very... So all sorts of conflicting information. Yeah, exactly. But here, hopefully, we'll get to the the the, the basis of it all and, and get some answers. Uh, joining me now, we have Peter Gillard Moss, whose son Arlo has multiple food allergies. Um, thank you very much, Peter, for joining us. When did you first realise there might have been a problem with Arlo? Well, when he, it was when he was a baby. So he had um, bad eczema and was wheezing from a young age and from around when he was born. But when he was six months, we gave him formula milk for the first time, and that caused a severe anaphylactic reaction. Um, so at that point, it was beyond a doubt, but we did have suspicions before then. So yeah, and then after that, he started kind of collecting other allergies. As, we, as he was introduced to foods, we started realizing that he was allergic to other things. Um, such as um, nuts and uh, eggs um, and also legumes and chickpeas to the point about peanuts being legumes. This was a thing I learned as well. He's also allergic to chickpeas and lentils because they're more similar to peanuts as a legume than they are to, say, um, a tree nut like a walnut. So what were the first signs you mentioned there that you had before he went into this anaphylactic shock? You, you noticed that there were signs you had worries yeah we've been taking him to the doctors before because he had really bad eczema and we weren't sure um what was causing it um and he would also get quite wheezing um th this was a bit of a problem because a lots of doctors would kept saying oh he's a happy wheezer or oh the eczema is just something that will clear um, when actually once we realized it was linked to the allergies and these were early signs of him of him being allergic so anaphylactic shock in a six month old, you must have been terrified. How did you cope in that instance? Uh, um, it was really hard. Um, so 
I mean, we gave him breast milk and, his, and, he, and he just started crying and crying. I mean, he, he kind of vomited it up and started crying and crying and crying. And his cry got smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and, and it was just, you know, you, you could hear him trying to cry, but no air was getting out as his, as his lungs were getting inflamed and stuff. And he was, his throat was closing up. It was really, really scary. Um, I, it, it, it lasted hours in my head, but it was probably not long. An ambulance arrived, took us to hospital, um, um, and that was it. But it was a really intense journey, as you can imagine. And Arlo's at school now. How do you cope? He has quite a few allergies. How do you cope with sending him to school? Um, I mean, actually, we're really lucky. The school um, he goes to is a local school. It's less than a mile away, so we're really close. Um, the, we know the chef, actually. She lives just around the road, and we know the chef, and she knows him, and she knows everything he's allergic to. So when he had free school meals early on, um, she knew exactly what, what to give him, and that was a real big thing for us. Um, he takes packed lunches now. The school has a nut-free policy. Um, when he goes on school trips, a funny thing is we he went on a school trip, and he's going to go on one this year as well, and we will stay nearby just in case. Um, and we have to do a lot of coordination with the, um, the, the, the companies that run those events as well. So yeah, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of work in the background. It sounds like a huge amount of communication involved, but it, it also sounds like you're very much on top of that. Thank you very much, Peter, for coming on and sharing your experiences. The six month old taking an anaphylactic shock is just my worst fear as a mother of an eight month old. I just think that must have been hell, actually just hell. You've got some EpiPens here. Yes. Now, is this the this wouldn't be the same sort of EpiPen you would give a six-month-old? It, it actually is. So um, I've got three different types of adrenaline auto-injectors, training pens that we use in the UK. So we have EpiPen that often people have heard about, Jext and Emirade. And the EpiPen and the Jext come in doses that could be used for a six-month-old if needed. They contain adrenaline. And often everybody's really worried about, do you use these in, in, in an emergency? And actually, we often know that they're not given in a timely fashion. And that's when we should worry. But the reality is we all produce adrenaline when we're stressed. My adrenaline levels are probably through the roof today. It is harmless in an otherwise um, healthy individual. And we always say, if in doubt, use it. So if you were, I'm completely yeah. healthy now. If I was to give myself an EpiPen, not to be done, yeah. but, but I thought was having an allergic reaction, it wouldn't actually have a negative or detrimental yeah. effect. It would only have a positive effect Absolutely. if I was having some sort of anaphylactic Absolutely. shock. And, and it just would be life saving. Schools sometimes have them. So there's an initiative called the Spare Pens in School. Um, and essentially, they can buy an adrenaline auto injector. And then anyone with an allergy should have an allergy action plan. And if they sign on it, that um, they give the permission for the schools to be able to issue an adrenaline auto injector if they've got one, then they can use it. And I did just want to mention on the aspect of schools. So I'm a trustee for Anaphylaxis UK charity. And they've got an amazing program where they train up um, schools about how to recognise allergies, how to treat it, how to cope with your school trips, which is important. Mm. And they've got a programme where they also have lesson plans for the children because there's a lot of bullying that goes on with food allergies, sadly. So unbelievably, I know. So it teaches children how to understand each other um, because actually, unfortunately, many adverse events take place in school settings. And also, the more people know how to use these, yeah. the better. Yeah. And it's just straight in They're the thigh. So they all have slightly different mechanisms just to make life a bit challenging. So I always say, if you hold it in the middle, you can't go wrong. They come in a pack, you take it out, it has an expiry date on the side and a little window and you just need to check that the fluid looks clear. So this is EpiPen, we say blue to the sky and orange to the thigh. So when you take the cap off, it's active. Mm -hmm. We personally, as allergists, likes to teach that you hold and you press firmly. Ooh. And in that way, you've got control of the leg and you're not going to accidentally lacerate. And you also, also need to hold it in for three seconds for the EpiPen. So we count elephants. One elephant, two elephant, three elephants. The needle then goes inside. So you can leave it safely on the side until the ambulance crew come and put it in the sharps bin. Um, the Jext is slightly different. So again, take the lid off and it's active. Hold against the thigh, press firmly. You hear a click on the trainer and the real pen. And this one you hold for 10 seconds. And finally, the Emirate just has one end, hold and press 
for five seconds. So they're all pretty much, they're very, they're very similar. similar. Um, I really hope they don't have adrenaline in them or you These really are, will or be I really trembling your way <laughs> for this studio. If in doubt, if you hold it for 10 seconds, you can't go wrong. So hold it in the middle, 10 seconds. Uh, 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 and, and ring an ambulance after you've done it. So, so do make it sure that that's done first. Helen from Northampton, you're up first. What's your question for Dr. Helen? Um, um, I've got a question. Um, my daughter is, she's been brought up, she's been allergic to nuts and eggs. And um, she has an eight month old baby. Every time she's been giving him any sort of egg in a pancake, he gets really, really sick. So she's stopped giving him egg because he, that keeps happening. But what we're wondering is, do you think any of the allergies from my daughter will pass on to him? Like um, nut allergy, would it pass on to him, do is you think? Is it hereditary? Well, it's a really good question. It's something that yes. all families worry about when they have um, an adult with an allergy. So when you're a parent, you increase your child's risk of what we call an atopic condition. So that's eczema, asthma, hay fever, food allergies, pet allergies. And that's what happened in our own family. I'm atopic. All of my children have got something. That's why I deviated into this. Um, so your daughter won't pass on the same risk. So there's no actual increased risk of a peanut allergy from a parent to a child. It's just of an atopic condition. But having said that, if that little one is reacting to egg and it certainly needs exploring, then there is an increased risk of a peanut allergy if you have an egg allergy. But you said that the baby was eight months old? Eight months old, but any sort of egg at all, so she's stopped now, yeah. um, gets very, very sick. Like just gets really yeah, yeah. like uh, throwing up hill and like the, yeah it, the baby but brings it back up everything not just a little bit he just gets really really sick yeah. so obviously we've stopped giving him egg okay. um but it was trial and error really you know because he's only introduced him to it recently okay. um so and when you say investigate it what would she do so, well, so go along to your GP and they'll need to take an allergy focused history to find out what's happening. Are there any other signs? Does babe need testing or are we going to give recommendations about when we might retrial this? But the other crucial thing for that baby is that really we want it to be eating peanut um, in the form of peanut butter. So not whole nuts because of the risk of choking, but peanut butter, you can water it down. It needs to go in the mouth, not on the skin, because otherwise it can cause contact reactions. And because baby has already got an egg allergy, and as I say, potential that there'd be a higher risk for a peanut allergy, we know actually the sooner you can get it in, and there's evidence now showing before six months, the better in terms of preventing allergy. Now, mum is going to need a lot of support in doing that because you mentioned she's got an allergy. So we need to think perhaps grandma or nana, you know, could you be the one to introduce that baby to peanut to keep mum safe? It would also be a very scary thing if you think they've already got an increased chance of having an allergic reaction. But yet yeah, th that information has changed around peanuts. Um, you only start weaning at six months as well. Yeah. So it's all very confusing. Helen, I really hope that helps. And, and I wish the little one all the best as well. Fingers crossed that there isn't an allergy. Maybe it's just a... Fingers crossed, coincidence. Um, Anne from Oxfordshire, you're up next. What question do you have for Dr. Helen? Actually, it's a very similar question, actually. I'm a new grandmother of a three-month-old uh, granddaughter. And my daughter had heard that if she, when she starts weaning, if she feeds um, liquidised peanut butter with eggs and milk, um, they won't get an allergy later in life. I don't know how true this is. And I thought I'd check it out with you. Yeah, it, it, it is true. So there's been um, quite long standing data that wasn't unfortunately about when my son was born 14 years ago. So he had um, milk and nut allergies. And basically, well, there were really good, well planned trials that showed um, in higher risk babies. So that's ones who have eczema or who have egg allergies. They are sadly at higher risk of peanut allergies. That if we introduce them to peanuts in the form of peanut butter, as I say, early in life, then they are much less likely to go on and develop allergies. So it reduced their chance by 82%. But in that original study, what they didn't do was exclude children who already had quite large skin prick tests, that's the allergy tests, or what they classed as low risk, so no eczema or very mild eczema or no allergies. And actually, the bulk of children with peanut allergies are children who didn't have any other allergies. And so um, Professor Graham Roberts and his team, so he's one of my colleagues at Southampton, they've extrapolated all the data and had a look. And what we can see quite clearly is if we can introduce children to peanut butter by before six months, so between four and six months, so yes, different weaning advice, then we will reduce their risk overall of 82% of peanut allergy. So we have a real opportunity to change peanut allergy in this country because over the last you know, 20 years, we've seen it go like that. 
and sadly, if you have a peanut allergy, you've only got a 20% chance of outgrowing it. Oh, what, so why has the, why, why have we seen, and that was going to be one of my questions, yeah. there seems to be an increase in the amount of people that have allergies. Mm. Is that just because we're more informed or there just is? No. So that part of it, of course, is that we know more about it. It's on our radar. I had an egg allergy when I was little. My mum was just told, well, just don't give it. Um, but actually, there definitely is a change. And what we did was we looked at data from Israel to say, well, in Israel, they give babies peanut as part of their weaning. You can be reassured that deaths in weaning babies have not been reported. So whilst anaphylaxis can occur, as we've seen with Arlo, deaths are incredibly rare. But if they, their rate of peanut allergy was really low because they wean with it. And that's where the data has come from. It's such a change as well. So yeah. uh, hopefully we got that message across. And thank you very much for your call. Huge thank you to Dr. Helen as well for joining us. Thanks for all your calls. We're going to have to move on. After the break, we are asking, should we be proud of Gary Lineker? We'll be speaking to the refugee who lived with them and thinks that we should be. 0207 862 is the number. And we'll speak to you right after this. Which insect can live without its head for weeks? Is it a ants? be cockroaches or see dragonflies. Find out which after the break.